Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing uh, leukocyte extravasation. Okay, so we've now looked at uh, type 1 activation of endothelial cells and how this can result in uh, neutrophil extravasation from the bloodstream. What we're now going to look at is type 2 activation of endothelial cells and how this can result in uh, another way by which uh, endo sorry, neutrophils can be uh, extravasated from the bloodstream and also how we can recruit uh, monocytes from the bloodstream which are the precursors to macrophages. Okay, so um, let's start with type 2 activation of endothelial cells then. So uh, interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha cause type 2 activation of endothelial cells. And we've discussed that this takes much longer than type 1 activation of endothelial cells. So type 1 activation will occur within minutes. Type 2 activation takes much longer. And it's because all of the effects of type 2 activation are brought about by changes in protein synthesis. Okay, so one of the effects of type 2 activation is that you will produce even more prostacyclin. Okay, so type 2 activation is going to result in the production of even more prostacyclin, which will result in even more vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles. So type 2 activation. So you'll start producing prostacyclin okay, or prostaglandin I2, and you'll produce even more than when you just had type 1 activation, okay, so that will produce even more relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle cells surrounding uh, the terminal arterioles, which will produce even more vasodilatation, i.e. an even larger blood supply to the affected area. Okay, you're also going to open up gaps between endothelial cells in a slightly more permanent way than uh, you did in type one, act, uh, type 1 activation. So you're going to get endothelial retraction, basically. So you're going to actually retract uh, the endothelial cells back. So let me show you this. So if I draw two neighboring endothelial cells here, so here is one endothelial cell, okay, and here is its neighbouring endothelial cell here. Then what we have to ask ourselves is why do these endothelial cells stay in this same shape? Okay, well it's because they have a very dense cytoskeletal network made of actin and tubulin microfibrils, uh, basically, or filaments. Okay, um, and these filaments are all over the place, forming a web in the uh, cytoplasm of the cell, and that's what is holding the cell in this shape. Okay, and I'll just have these endothelial cells sitting on a basement membrane here, just to complete the picture. Okay, so what's going to happen is that in type 2 activated endothelial cells, you're going to dismantle the um, actin and tubulin cytoskeleton in the edges of these endothelial cells here. So all of the cytoskeleton in these terminal portions is going to be dismantled, and when you do that, then the cell membrane will just collapse down, basically. There's nothing holding the cell membrane up anymore, and the cell membrane's not rigid, so it will just collapse back down, and the cell will basically retract down to here, so it's as though that bit doesn't exist, well, it doesn't exist anymore, okay? And the same thing will happen to endothelial cell 2 over here. So you've now got a massive great gap between these endothelial cells, so you'll bring back the boundaries of your endothelial cells, basically, and this will increase vascular permeability even more uh, in the uh, capillaries and the post-capillary venules. So you'll build up an even larger inflammatory exudate, you'll bring in those complement proteins, those coagulation factors, and those calocrine kinin cascade uh, proteins. Okay, and those will help to attack the pathogens in the case of complement proteins, help to contain the pathogens in the case of coagulation factors, and help to uh, um, get a positive feedback uh, mechanism for type 1 activation in the case of the calocrine kinin system proteins. Okay, uh, so that's another result of type 2 activation. Okay, now the other result is that you're going to get increased neutro neutrophil extravasation. 
And the reason is that you now start synthesizing new proteins that are involved in the recruitment of neutrophils. Okay, so firstly, you're going to increase your production of ICAM1, which was already constitutively expressed, but you're now going to increase that expression. Okay, then you're going to start making a whole new protein known as E-selectin, which is again within the selectin family of cell adhesion molecules. So here, we're going to start putting on our surface E-selectin. Okay, and we have increased our expression of ICAM1, so let me put ICAM1 over here. So the intercellular adhesion molecule 1. Okay, and we have are also going to start producing a chemokine known as CXCL8, which stands for the CXC chemokine. So chemokines are proteins um, which all have a conserved structure, basically. They've all got very, very similar structures. Okay, now there are four main families of chemokines. The CXC chemokines, the CC chemokines, the C chemokines, and the CX free C chemokines. And all of those four families, the uh, CXC and the CC chemokines are the most important. So CXCL8 is a member of this CXC chemokine family, and it stands for CXC chemokine ligand 8. Okay, now it's so important that it's also got another name. It's also known as interleukin 8. Now, it's a very small protein, between 8 and 10 kilodaltons, and basically, it is not an integral membrane protein. It is going to be stuck on the apical surface of the cell, but it's not going to be uh, implanted into the phospholipid bilayer. Instead, it's going to be attached onto the glycocalyx. So let me explain what the glycocalyx is. So basically, on the surface of all endothelial cells in your body, uh, you have something known as the glycocalyx, okay? And this is basically a whole bunch of polysaccharides which are attached onto the surface of the endothelial cell, okay? So what I'm drawing in green here, this represents the glycocalyx. Okay, so how do you attach these polysaccharides onto the surface of uh, your endothelial cell? Well, if we draw a picture here, so if this is the membrane, then the membrane will have integral membrane proteins here. What's going to happen is the polysaccharides are going to get attached to the integral membrane proteins. So you'll have this polysaccharide in green, which is the glycocalyx. Okay, now one of the key polysaccharides that's within the glycocalyx is uh, a polysaccharide known as heparan sulfate. And it's often referred to as heparan sulfate proteoglycan. But heparan sulfate is its full name. People add the proteoglycan on just to add a little bit of extra information. So this tells you, this word proteoglycan tells you that it's a polysaccharide. That's what glycan means. And then proteo means that it's attached to proteins. So you can see why that name is appropriate because we've got a polysaccharide that is attached to the integral membrane proteins. Okay, so heparan sulfate proteoglycans are one of the key components of the glycocalyx. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, basically, it's because this CXCL8 chemokine is going to end up attached to the heparan sulfate proteoglycan that is within the glycocalyx of our endothelial cell. So the CXC L8 is going to end up attached to the glycocalyx. So here it is in pink here. So, it's not an integral membrane protein. It's not attached to integral membrane proteins. Instead, it's attached to the heparan sulfate proteoglycan, which in turn is attached to integral membrane proteins. So here is our CXC chemokine ligand 8, now on the surface of our endothelial cell. Okay, so the two huge new key players here are our E-selectin in orange here and our ICAM1 which we'll have in red here. But, uh, sorry, and our CXCL8 is the new player. ICAM1 is not a new player. ICAM1 has just been upregulated by type 2 activation. Okay, so E selectin and CXL8 are the new players. So, what's now going to happen? Well, it's almost an identical process to what we saw before. So, basically, 
if I get another piece of paper, you're going to start off with the process of rolling, okay? And this will involve the neutrophil rolling along the surface of the blood vessel and continuously forming and breaking interactions between the E-selectin, which is now on the surface of the endothelial cell, and the ligand for E-selectin that is on the surface of the neutrophil. Okay, so here's our neutrophil with this multi-lobe nucleus here. Okay, so let me colour this in. And basically, on the surface of the neutrophil, you have a ligand for E-selectin. Okay, so let me colour in E-selectin in orange again and I'll colour the ligand for E-selectin in green. Now, what is the ligand for E-selectin? Well, it's a tiny little molecule known as Cyalyl Lewis X. Okay, so this is Cyalyl Lewis X. Oh, and there's a dash between those. Cyalyl Lewis X. Okay, and here this is E-selectin on the surface of the endothelial cell. Now, Basically, the neutrophil will roll along, it'll continuously break interactions between Cyanol, Lewis X, and E-selectin, and then it'll form new interactions, and it'll just roll along the endothelial cells, gradually slowing down. Okay, so the first process is rolling, and this involves these interactions between Cyanol, Lewis X, and E-selectin. Now, I said Cyanol, Lewis X was a tiny little molecule, so what is it? It's not a protein. Instead, it's a tiny little carbohydrate molecule that's attached to other proteins. So it's directly attached to integral membrane proteins in the uh, neutrophil membrane, and then the E-selectin will attach to the Cyanol Lewis, and hence to the uh, neutrophil. Okay, so the next stage was that you formed a weak adhesion. So the neutrophil comes to a stop, it comes to a standstill, and you form a weak adhesion. Now, this portion is exactly the same as it was originally, okay? So you're going to form an interaction between uh, the integrin cell adhesion molecule, lymphocyte function associated antigen 1, LFA1, okay, here. So this is LFA1, and you're also going to form an interaction, well, and it's going to be bound to ICAM1 on the surface of the endothelial cell. So intercellular adhesion molecule 1 will form a bond with the lymphocyte function associated antigen 1. So here is LFA1 in red, okay, and we'll have ICAM1 in yellow here. Okay, right. So, these will form initially a very weak interaction because the integrin has not been activated. Okay, so the next step will now be to activate the integrin, and this is what the CXC chemokine ligand 8 is going to do. Okay, so I'll try and squeeze this in all on this same picture. Okay, so here is our CXC chemokine ligand 8. If I use very bold colours, then it should show up anyway, so we'll use vivid purple here for CXC chemokine ligand 8. And remember, that's on the surface of the um, endothelial cell on the heparan sulfate uh, proteoglycan of the glycocalyx. And that's going to bind now to the receptor for the CXC chemokine ligand 8. And the receptor for the CXC chemokine uh, ligand 8 is the CXC receptor 1. So the receptor is going to be the CXC chemokine receptor 1. So in full, this is the CXC chemokine, which re again, remember, just denotes the family of chemokines that we're talking about. And then it's the receptor number 1. Okay, so CXCRs mean CXC chemokine receptors, and CXCLs mean CXC chemokine ligands, so they are the CXC chemokines. Okay, so we'll have the CXC chemokine receptor 1 in blue here. Okay, now, uh, what will happen is when the CXC ligand 8 uh, binds to uh, the CXCR1 on the surface of the neutrophil, that will lead to integrin activation. Now remember this integrin, LFA1, is alpha L, not alpha 4, oh dear. Couldn't resist, could I? No, alpha L and then beta 2. 
Okay, and you'll get integrin activation, and that will hugely strengthen the interaction between this uh, LIFA1, as it's often referred to as, and ICAM1, and then you'll get tight adhesion. Okay, so this will go to a very tight adhesion. Okay, and that will firmly attach this neutrophil to the endothelial cell. Then what happens is exactly the same process. So the neutrophil is going to sliver through the gaps in the endothelial cells, which are now much bigger because of type 2 activation. And uh, whilst it's slivering through those gaps, it will be uh, forming interactions uh, between PCAM1 molecules on its surface and PCAM1 molecules on the surface of the endothelial cell, and that will help it to sliver through that gap and get into the interstitial fluid where it will then phagocytose pathogens. Okay, so the final step is then just diapedesis, and I'll put it down here, or endothelial transmigration. So diapedesis. Okay, right, so the final thing that we're going to discuss in this video is uh, the recruitment of monocytes which occurs in type 2 activated endothelial cells. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion where we'll talk about monocytes in the next video.